All right, good morning. Good morning. I love the part of that song that says that his wounds paid our ransom. And we're going to hear that theme a little bit this morning as we consider our service unto God that by his death and his resurrection, he purchased us. He ransomed us. But not only did he purchase us, but he purchased us for a purpose, that we may serve him with our lives and to the very end that we be with him. So we're going to hear a little bit of that theme across our sermon today as Jesus begins to address with the disciples the duty of service for the Christian. And so last week, we began Luke 17 uh, as Jesus, in verse 1 through 6, as Jesus begins his instructions more specifically for the disciples, as he begins to talk to them about uh, the issue of temptation, you know, the issue of our Christian's witness and how we live, that we may cause other people to stumble. But he also leans in on the necessity of forgiveness in our relationships. And so one of the things that the disciples seem to really understand after listening to this teaching, this exhortation to them, is that strength from above is needed to live the kind of life that bears the fruit of faith. Now, such reliance is accomplished when we remain in trustful fellowship with God, like a mustard seed that maintains uninterrupted contact with this nourishing environment. And further, we talked about, we spent a little time in John 15 last week, that an abiding heart in Jesus is needed to live for him. So resist him to temptations, that includes to avoid causing others to stumble. And as I mentioned earlier, earlier, having a spirit of forgiveness will produce fruitful relationships within the church body. That not only that we will endeavor to serve God, but we as brothers and sisters in Christ will push others into the calling that God has set for them. And so the disciples, in hearing this truth, they asked for what they needed the most. They looked upon the Lord and they said, Lord, this is in verse 5 of Luke 17, they said, Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. They learned that nothing is impossible in God. Or as Jesus says of such faith in verse 6, he says, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea. And it would obey you. And so now they've received this assurance from God. And so now having received this assurance, the disciples needed to understand the very next question that they must know. The very next question is this. What is the right attitude and heart that is required in the service of the Lord? And Jesus answers this by offering another very small parable that really highlights the relationships between a master of a small farm and one servant. So if you are able to stand, we're going to read our short few verses of Luke 17 as we read the word of God. Luke chapter 17, our focus area will be verses 7 through 10. And just for the sake of our sermon today, I'm going to go back to verse 1 so we can understand all this is in one block. So verse 1, he says, To disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea, than he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. And the apostle said to the Lord, Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you have faith like the grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now in verse 7, he says, will any one of you who has a servant plowing and keeping a sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at a table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterwards? You will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what is our duty. 
Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have died, that your son has rose from the grave, that he ascended back to heaven, that you have called us unto yourself to a higher calling. We thank you, Father, Lord, that because of what you have done in our lives, because of the grace and abounded love that has been heaped upon us in the form of your special favor, that we, it's not about the fact that we have to serve you, but we get to serve you. That it is a privilege and our honor to serve you until the very end out of thanksgiving and gratitude. And so, Lord, as we open up your word this morning, that you would help us to understand all the nuances of this truth. But help us to also be blessed in not only hearing your word, but as your word says, that we would do, that we begin to walk out in the truth that you have prepared for us. As the Lord help us, we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And so, in verse 7, okay, Jesus, what he does, he, he gives a small, very small parable. And he gives this picture of like a typical slave who does what he is told by his master who retains rights of possession of him. And so when we start thinking about the first verse or so of our focus text today, what does this teach us about our relationship with our Lord, right? Who is Jesus' is Lord and our master. What does this teach us? So a couple of thoughts I want to share with you this morning. Number one, it's always important that when you're reading the Bible is that you need to remember who is the Bible talking to. Who is Jesus talking to? He is speaking to his disciples, which means he is speaking to us. Number two, what is the definition of a slave? Okay, it is one, just very basic definition, it is one who is the legal property of another for laborious service. And as an interpretive note of this specific text, the correct rendering in the Greek in this text is that of a slave. It's synonymous with servant. Okay? Number three, why is being a slave a better representation of our relationship with our Lord versus a lot of times in our modern culture how we think of a servant? Because in our modern culture, when we think of a servant, we often think of that as optional. Right? I have my own life. I'm going to do what I'm going to do, okay? You know, whether you're serving in the church or you're serving someone out the church, whenever God is calling you to do, sometimes we think those things are just optional. I can serve, I can not serve, because why? In my mind, I am ruler over my own life, right? But this is not what Jesus is teaching that is required of the Christian. And so here's a couple reasons why being a slave to Christ is a better representation of our relationship with our Lord, and it is a good thing for you and I. Number one, okay, as we heard in our last song, right, the Bible teaches that we have been purchased by God, redeemed by the blood sacrifice of Jesus. And so we have to remember in this life, if we think about it, we are never free. We talk about freedoms all the time. I want to be free. I want to be free to make my own decision, all these different things. But if you understand what the Bible teaches about who we are and who God is, we are never fully free. Why? Because the Bible teaches without apology that we will either be slaves to sin, that is a self-led life which leads to bondage and destruction, or we will be a slave to Christ, which leads to true freedom and eternal life. We will be a slave to something. You know, Charles Spurgeon, who speaks on this topic, he says these words, he says, we are the servants, the slaves to Christ, and we rejoice to be so. Because in this lies our deliverance from the bondage of sin. No man can really be his own master. He will either serve one Lord or another. We are such dependent creatures that we must give ourselves up to either be servants of sin or servants of righteousness. We, we starting to get the picture here, right? And so Jesus purchased us so that we know we'll, we'll be no longer slaves to sin, but we will be slaves to righteousness. 
And we see Peter gives the Christian exiles to the Roman Empire in his letter. He gives them this same encouragement. Okay, he exhorts them to obey their new master, who is Jesus, in the midst of the trials that they face and the sin that dwells within and turn away from our old master, that old person who has been put away by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, this is in verses 13 through 19, he says, Therefore, preparing your minds for actions and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passion of your former ignorance. But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially, according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself in the fear throughout your time of your exile. And then he gets to it in verse 18. He says, knowing that you were ransomed, purchased from the feudal ways you inherited from your forefathers, not with the perishable things such as silver and gold. In other words, that when God came down to purchase us and save us from sin, he did not use anything made in creation. He did not go what we do sometimes that we have to do when we go to the bank and we have to pay someone else's debt with things in creation. But he took all that is living, all that is in Christ, and he put his own son on the cross and purchased us with blood from Jesus. So he says, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And so the reason why the term slave is more appropriate is because Jesus purchased us to be his, to live and to rule over our lives for his glory, but most importantly, for our good, for our good. You know, it's kind of like when you talk to your children sometimes, right? And you're wrestling with them about things and they can't see. They can't see that what you're saying to them may sound a little bit painful, but you are the parent, you have experienced it and you're doing it for their good. You're telling them, I can't let you do that. I, I have to do these things because I've been your age, okay? Now, how much more does a father know better than we do for our good? And so Jesus purchased us, right? But what for? What for? It's definitely not to, you know, whenever you, you know, back in our American history, when slaves were purchased, they weren't purchased just to go uh, sit up in the cut in the master's house. They were purchased for a reason, for a purpose. And we were purchased by God that we would continue his gospel mission that has much work to be done. And as Brother Norman read Matthew 9, what did he read? That Jesus said that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We are to serve God with sincerity and in the fear of the Lord. And that's why Paul taught in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 through 24. He says, whatever you do, work heartily. As for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And see, you and I are able to obey this command when we embrace the disposition of a slave. Or in some of our English translation, it says bond servant. We are able to obey this when we embrace this disposition to our wonderful God, our wonderful God. Because see, under Christ's lordship, our lives are not our own. We are his possessions, his prize to live and carry out his will. And as bond service, our master's desires are ours. What he hates, we hate. What he loves, we love. And our greatest joy is that his will be done and he be glorified in our lives. And so when we start to grow in that type of disposition in our servant, here's what's going to happen. That such joy and manifestation, joy, love and joy will manifest itself in our labors and our attitudes for him. It becomes more each day about Christ than ourselves. It becomes more about his labors and what needs to be done than our personal conference and our convenience. <clears throat> 
And this is the reason why Paul, one of my favorite passages that he says in all his letters, in Galatians 2, verse 20, he says that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. He says it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so remember when Jesus gives the apostles and he gives the disciples these instructions about having a spirit of forgiveness. Learning to walk and obey God so that in your living for God, you don't become a stumbling block for people. They recognize I don't have that within myself. They recognize that in my sinful condition, I don't want to have anything to do with that at all. Because in my own nature, it's about me. And so they recognize by the spirit, Lord, increase our faith. Help us to be more like you. And that's what we're endeavoring to do. So in Christ, our lives are no longer our own. It is his to live and rule over. Now, I don't know how many of y'all remember this, but in the 1980s, there was this kind of lordship salvation controversy that went on in Christian circles in the 1980s. Okay, and and there was a heretical belief going around in American church circles that people would say that, well, I can accept Jesus as savior. But not as Lord. Okay, this is in the 1980s. And if you go, you can read some folks like John MacArthur, some of those guys that were kind of titans during that time. They had to rail. They had to speak against those things. But this is what was being believed in Christian circles that you would hear people say things like, well, you know, I accepted Jesus Lord as three years ago, uh, as Savior three years ago, but not as Lord. OK, but see, here's the thing. OK. You know, the issue with that is, is that no one can receive Christ as Savior while rejecting him as Lord. Because when someone says that, well, because what they're really saying is, is that, well, uh, I accept the Jesus Savior because I want fire insurance. I want insurance against hell. OK, but then I don't accept him as Lord because I still want to live the way I wanted to live. But see, we know what the Bible teaches that when the Holy Spirit comes in and brings forth faith, God is not interested in making us nicer people. He's not interested in slapping lipstick on a pig. That when you see people change in the scriptures, there is entirety transformation. These are not perfect people, but they begin to change in almost every way. And they go the direction, they go the direction of Christ. Okay? And so no one can receive Christ as Savior while rejecting him as Lord. We, if, we are to, if we are in Christ, we are to yield to his rightful rule of our lives like a master to a slave. Why? Because true freedom is only found in bond service to Jesus. And when you and I become a Christian, we submit to his lordship. Why? Because Jesus served us with his life. With his life. The father spared nothing of his son but had his blood pour completely out on the cross. Completely out. Not only that, but Jesus experienced the full measure of what it's like to be in sin, to suffer for sin, even to have his own father turn his back on him on the cross. That's why he cries out and he says, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? He filled, he, the full cup of wrath poured out on him for us. And so that is the reason why we serve him. Because he's already proven that he loves us and we serve him. And so we are to submit to his lordship because he served us. And that's the reason why, if you get in our focus text in verse 8, Jesus is starting to lean in. He says, will he, that's the master, rather say to him, the servant, after he's been out in the field all day and he comes inside, his service is not done, right, for his master. He says, prepare supper for me. And dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink. And afterwards, you will eat and drink. And so what is Jesus saying? It's because he's served us with his entire life. That our service for God never ends on this side as long as we're on this side of heaven. It never ends until we go on to be with him in glory. Right? You know, my, my father always jokes with me all the time. He says, son, as a matter of Christian service, he said, I can't find retirement in the Bible. Do you find it? 
And I said, no, Dad, I don't see it there. You know, I don't see it there. You know, because pictures of retirement in God look like Moses. How old was Moses when God retired him? 120 years old, right? And God told him to go up Mount Nebo, and he buried him up there when he see Moses again. Retirement for Elijah looked like what? A chariot of fire to the very end. And we have some that if you've been living long enough and you're a seasoned saint, we've got some in here that maybe they can't get around the way they used to. Okay, maybe they can't, they can't come to all things and stuff like that. They got all these things going on. But these saints pray on their face before the Father is moving things in the church more than some of us doing things in the church because their work is not done. Until God calls you from this place, what does that mean? That means he still has a purpose for your life. And so our work is never done. And so Jesus continues in verse 9. He says, does he, that's the master, thank the servant because he did what was commanded. Now this one's going to be a little bit harder, big, large, as my wife would call it, horse pill to chew, even for me. Okay, because I'm right there in the camp with y'all. But we need to embrace what Jesus is saying. Okay, we need to remember two truths that will help shape our attitudes and humility when we're serving God. Number one, remember when you and I are serving God, we're not doing him any favors. Okay, we're not doing him any favors. Number two, God does not need us to carry out his will. Okay, I got, we got to say that out loud because, you know, I haven't been around a little bit in a lot of different circles, and we got folks believing a lot of different things, that if they don't do their part, that somehow it's not going to get done. I won't find that nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible. And guess what? And if it's for you to do, oh, God going to make sure you do it. Just ask Jonah. It's going to get done. It's going to get done. It's amazing how repentance comes forward when you see uh, acid and all that stuff flowing around you in the belly of a fish. And it's not devouring you. Oh, confession and repentance is coming. Okay, it's amazing that when Jonah got spit out on dry land, you know, he was days behind what he was supposed to be in Nineveh, but the Bible says he ran and got there fast after God had to deal with him. But we have to remember what Jesus is saying is that we're not, again, we're not doing any God any favors by serving him, and he does not need us to carry out his will. And that's important for us to embrace because sometimes, and this is all of us, we can be self-absorbed in our attitudes in serving God. We can begin to think within ourselves that if God, that God is wholly dependent on our service. And without it, it won't get done. And as I said earlier, we have some in Christian circles that falsely believe that God cannot do anything in the earth without man's permission. It's called dominionism. Just go read it. It's to me. I don't have time to get into the, the heresy that it is, but it's called dominionism. And then they take... The garden of, they take the garden scene with Adam and Eve and wherein God gave man dominion in the earth, right? They twist that and grossly misinterpret it and apply it in such a way that God can't do anything in the earth without man's permission. Okay, that's, that's heresy, by the way. But at the end of the day, that's some of the attitudes that are prevailing in our culture, in the church. Number two. We have some that hold what I would like to call this philanthropist mentality towards God. Let me explain to what I mean. In other words, as if God is helpless without our assistance and therefore out of pity for God, we will be benevolent and help him. Right? But we do. We take that position sometime. But dear child, remember God does not need us. We need him. We need him. We also have to remember that God can get his worship without us as well. Y'all remember the triumphal entry? Luke chapter 19. As was prophesied in the Old Testament, Jesus comes into Jerusalem just before his crucifixion on a donkey's cult. And they are worshiping him as they should worship him. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Pharisees, right, they see this worship and they rebuke Jesus. They rebuke him because they say, you know, you shouldn't be getting this worship. But what does Jesus respond? It's in Luke 9, 19, verse 40. What does he say? He says, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The very stones would give him glory. And so there's some things we have to remember about God. 
you know, remember the psalm, it's in Psalm chapter 50, verse 12 to 15, when they speak of God, God says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world in its fullness are mine. Do I eat flesh of bulls and drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. So what is Jesus teaching the disciples and therefore us because we are his disciples? Is that we are to serve him with our lives with thanksgiving and gratitude. Why? Because when we do so, it's in response to what Jesus has done for you and I. That is our worship. It's in response. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a what? Living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. A thankful heart God will receive. A heart that is grateful to be with him, God will receive. Even with the little you have, a child that will worship God, that will sing for him, that has no earthly possessions whatsoever, God fully receives. So that's what we should remember. So these things should shape our hearts in humility when we're serving God. So if God does not need us, right, to serve him, to carry out his will, then we should move on to the, the very next logical question. Then why? Why then does God invite us to serve him at all? Why does he do it? A couple things that I want to share with you, and these should be encouragements to us. Number one, God invites us to serve him that we may learn and experience his love. That we may learn and experience his love. A lot of people are struggling with God's love because they have yet to put their shovel to the ground. They have yet to take their place in his kingdom to serve him. But it's through serve him. You look at the Old Testament, New Testament, that, that the people of God learned who God was in obeying and serving him. Right? See, it's one thing, again, to be told that God has loved us. But it's another thing to experience it. Those are two different things. You know, I could tell my child all day long that I love him, but unless they see it happening, me Given that affection to them, they don't know what love you speak of, right? And so God loves us. What he says is important, but we experience it through serving him. An invitation to co-labor with him in his will is an act of his love and grace. And serving him towards others, that blesses us. That blesses us. That's why Paul tells the Ephesian elders. Remember in Acts chapter 20, he gathers them all together. Right? Before he get ready to go off. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. What does he say to them? He says, it is more blessed to give than receive. And through serving, we experience God's love as he generously gifts us. Because we're going to get to that. He generously gifts us with his spirit and strength from heaven. Because remember, God is love. And God gives of himself that we may share in his goodness. What other God does that? There are none. There are none. Think of the blessings of that. So God, God causes us to serve him so that we may learn and experience his love. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, again, Peter speaking to the Christian exiles, he says, As each has received the gift, because God has given you and I something from him. We all have gifts, spiritual gifts, and we all have physical, practical skills and talents. God has given us both. He says, as each has received the gift, use it to serve one another as good, stewards, as good stewards of God's various grace. It is a privilege to serve him. It is a privilege to suffer for his name. Because in our hearts, what we're always focused on is how will God get glory out of this? So why then does Jesus, why then does God invite us to serve him? That we may learn and experience his love. Number two, God invites us to serve him to, to teach us how to obey him. To teach us how to obey him. Right? And so if we're ever to grow in obedience, we must embrace serving God. Now, if you've been serving God for a long time, here's what you already know. Serving is often hard work. 
it can be difficult. And then when you talk about the matters of serving God, our sinful condition finds serving God to be futile. Futile and unrewarding. You know, think about it. I know for myself, when I get up in the morning, you know, my flesh is like, why do I have to go in today? Let's go back to bed. Okay? You know, when it comes to a matter of sitting down to pray, how hard is it to pray? Right? The flesh don't want to sit there and pray in the spirit. No. The flesh want to get up and go do other things. But it takes the spirit to be there with us so that way that we would serve God in prayer. And so, if we're ever to grow in obedience, we must embrace serving God. Because see, it's in suffering for him in our labors. It's in suffering that sanctifies our hearts and purifies our motives that produces obedience. And remember, Jesus walked the earth, and he was about the Father's business, serving his Father. And we see the process that Jesus goes through, suffering for his Father's name and his own. And if that process was good enough for our Lord, then it's got to be good enough for us. Because remember Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, he says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. What he suffered. And we already understand this principle just at our own practical level. If any of you play sports, you understand this. Because the only way you're going to be good at being a cornerback is that you're going to have to suffer training. You're going to have to put the honey buns down and all that stuff in the offseason. And you're going to push away from some things and suffer your delights so that way you can be in shape. You're also going to have to suffer listening to your coach because they're in authority, not you. And they're going to have to teach you where to be, how to be, how to replace. All the, you're going to suffer all these things of discipline, right? And in doing that, you learn to obey. And that way, when the play is called, you're the only cornerback that's not out of position on the field. Out of position on the field. And how much more in Jesus, if we listen to him and we do as he commands, we learn how to obey him. We learn how to obey him. And so the third thing that I think is very important, that's the reason why, why does God invite us to serve him? The third and last thing is that, and it's really the most important thing, is that you and I may become vessels of his glory. Vessels of his glory. See, the Bible teaches that the work that God starts in us, he will complete. And as I've said before, the gospel mission can be difficult and hard, we are assured of this truth. We are assured that its success is wholly dependent on the power and the faithfulness of God. That anything good that you and I achieve, anything that is noteworthy of good report, all these various things is because God has done it. God has done it. And so when we co-labor with God with a heart that desires His glory, not our own, we will be diligent in our work and steadfast in the mission regardless of the hindrances and the setbacks. And if you've been in ministry long enough, if you've been a Christian long enough just dealing with people, whether it's your work and the place is like, because Christian ministry happens outside this building, every place you go, Christian ministry should be going on because you are a light of the world, you are the salt of the earth everywhere you're going. It's hard dealing with people and it's hard wrestling with ourselves. But everywhere you and I go, if you are endeavoring to do God's work, it is painful and it's difficult. But because if you desire God's glory, you will persist in setbacks. And here's because why? There will be. There are going to be bad days. There are going to be setbacks. There are going to be some conversations when you sit down and talk to that sister of faith and you, they're going to ask you, how did that go? You're going to say, that didn't go well. That didn't go well. I need prayer. It just didn't go the way I planned. And I said some things because I got upset and it just didn't go well. God help me. Okay, we're going to have days like that. Okay, but we will persist through the challenges such as lack of timely resources. We will persist through friction with people. We will persist also because you and I struggle daily with sin. We will persist through those things. And when the works is complete... When we see what is going on, we will know with all our hearts it's because God 
has done it. He has done it. And we will rejoice with the psalmist and declaring in Psalm 115, verse 1, when they say, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give the glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Hallelujah. We're, pray, we're thankful for God because when you look at the things that God has done and you rejoice, you rejoice because he has done it. But you can see how through all that you endeavor to serve the Lord, but you also saw your imperfections along the way, but it got done nevertheless. Glory be to God. And so when Jesus says of the master in our focus test, going back to our focus test in verse 9, he says, does he thank the servant? Because he did what was commanded. The answer to that is no. He does not. You know, he, because all the glory is owed to the master. That is God, right? He alone gets all the credit. Because why? Think about what God has to do for us to even serve him. Number one, we have to have material resources, right? You ain't doing nothing without material resources, okay? But according to God's timing and will, he will provide everything that is needed. He will provide everything is needed. Sometimes we just miss God. We don't have the stuff right now, but God will provide in his timing. Number two, we don't just need material resources, but we need spiritual resources. Lord, without his spirit and without his gifts, I don't care how many material resources you got. You will not be able to serve God according to his will for his glory. Right? We're just not going to be able to. Okay, but God grants spiritual gifts necessary for us to perform the work. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul starts to talk about spiritual gifts with the Corinthian church. Right. And he talks about that they're an assortment of spiritual gifts. He also talks about that they come from the same source. And he also speaks to why they are given. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 4, listen to what Paul says. He says, now there are a variety of gifts but of the what? Same spirit. There are a variety of service, but the same Lord. There are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. And then he says this, to each is given, that's the Christian, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for what? The common good. Or in some English translations, it says for the profit of all, right? Right? It's not just a prophet for those in the faith, but it is for those outside the faith that they may come, they may be drawn by our master and come and share in his goodness for the profit of all. So the spiritual gifts are not given for you and I to benefit. It is given to be poured out of us for others. It's kind of like a tree, right? You know, you read in the Old Testament, you know, you read in Psalms chapter one, it talks about the righteous man. He is like a tree, right? A tree is not grown and spreads his leaves for his own benefit. A tree benefits those that see it, that walk by and look and see how glorious, that just to look at it, how glorious the tree is. The tree is there for the benefit because someone can see its fruit and they can go over there and have some of that fruit. You ever had like a real orange off of a tree? That's different from what we see in H-E-B. They look like horse oranges, okay? But a real orange off a tree, you pluck it, it's really small, but it's really sweet. But it's for someone else to enjoy. Remember, we are called, we've been ransomed by God to be what? Vessels of his glory. Vessels of his glory. And so Paul says in verse 7, I mean, uh, Paul says in verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 12, he says, to each has been given a manifestation of the spirit for the common good. And then he lists all the spiritual gifts. He lists them. And then in verse 11, look at what he says. He says, all these are empowered by one. And the same spirit who apportions to each one as he individually wills. So as God has willed, God gives you and I gifts. And he doesn't give them all the same gifts. The nerve of God to spread his gifts out to all his children. 
And sometimes what we're doing, we're stumbling and we, we're not even doing what we're supposed to be doing because we're looking at somebody else. We're looking over how good and how great things seem to be going over there, but we're not focusing on the fact that, you know what, that God didn't give you those gifts, but he gave you these gifts. And he did that because he was good. He, get that, he did that because he created you to do this very thing. That's the reason why also in 1 Corinthians 12, he doesn't just, Paul doesn't just stop at that there's these variety of spiritual gifts, but then he uses the human body to talk about how we are to work and we're joined together. Not all of the feet, not all of the eyes. I ain't got time to get into all that, but you get the picture, right? That's what God is saying. So God has to give us all the material resources. He's got to give us all the spiritual resources. And God has to give us the physical constitution to do his work. So whether you are young or old, God has to give us a measure of physical strength and a sound mind to do his work. Remember the, the man... Uh, who had the legion of demons in him. Remember him? He's out of his mind. He's off in caves, and they can't even keep him in chains. He ain't got no clothes on, all these various things. And here comes Jesus. And these demons see Jesus, and they come. And Jesus casts this legion of demons out of him into a herd of pigs, right? And so now the, the pigs was a business, by the way. OK, so the people is keeping the pigs going to town until they masses and they come out and they see Jesus out there. But the Bible says one of the first things they see, they ain't paying attention to Jesus, but they see this man they knew that was in these caves. They see him fully clothed and in his right mind. In his right mind. That's the power of Jesus. But Jesus didn't purchase him and ransom and save him and deliver him for no purpose. But he told him to go to your people and tell them what God has done. For you, his very presence is a witness to the goodness of God. And out of response to what God has done, he serves him. And so lastly, in verse 10, Jesus gets to it, the duty of service. Verse 10, he says, so you also, when you have done all you've been commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. See, Jesus exhorts that our service to God is our responsibility. As a Christian, it is not optional that when you come into Jesus, guess what you also come into? Discipleship. Discipleship. Where you follow our master and you learn from him and then you go where he sends you. You do what he tells you, even over yourself. And the disciples are an excellent picture of this wrestling back and forth between what they want to do and what Jesus wanted to do. And so... God provides all we need to be successful in serving him. So again, as I've said before, there can be no boasting in human strength and accomplishment before him. And this is the reason why Paul talks about his relationship with Apollos. Y'all remember Apollos in the Bible? You know, you see him on the scene in the book of Acts. You know, the Bible says he was well-spoken, right? And he would go in, he would refute the Jews about the gospel. But Paul and Apollos are both apostles of God, okay? But notice all the apostles served in different roles and functions, okay? So Paul was one, as an apostle, he planted churches, right? He would plant churches and he would move on to the next. But he would always leave behind some of the other apostles, and Paul was one of them. He would be left behind, and what would he do? He would lead those churches, he would give them biblical leadership, and he would teach them and nurture them in the word of God. That was his role. And this, especially in the first century, if you just read the book of Acts, this was a hard work. It was a very difficult work for them to do. And they did a lot that they probably, in a human sense, could stand and say, look at all the stuff that we have done. Right? But notice what Paul says when he compares what they do to who the glory really goes to. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 to 7, listen to what Paul says. He says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants whom you have believed, as the Lord assigned to each. He says in verse 6, I planted, in other words, he planted churches, Apollos watered. Right? He stayed and nurtured those churches with the truth. He says, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. And then he gets to it in verse 7. He says, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. And that's important for us to remember and understand. 
Number two, especially in our culture today, uh, in our church culture today, no additional righteousness has been merited to us because we serve him. We add no righteousness to what Christ has done because we serve God. Not a tittle. Okay? Nor, uh, neither does our service place God under any obligation to do any favors for us. Because some in our church circles believe that. They believe that God is some sort of cosmic concierge. That God is not a genie in the bottle. That if we rub him some right way, that he is obligated to grant wishes. But we have some that believe that, especially in these see faith type of belief structures. That if I pray a certain prayer, because I have an earthly desire, and I have faith that God can do it, and I pray a certain prayer, and I say a certain thing in a formulaic way, that God is to do this thing for me. Please show me where you find that in the Bible. You can't. Because our service of God is not for him to do special favors, but because he's already done it. What more does God have to do? He opened up heaven and gave us Jesus. That is our reward. That is our reward. And then he did not abandon us here when Jesus went back. But he says, I will never leave you, never forsake you. But he has given us of himself, his spirit to live in us. And not only that, his spirit not only is there as an advocacy for us, but his spirit must pray for us. That God left nothing undone as his precious children. He's given us everything that we need. And so we have to remember that our service to God is not transactional in exchange for earthly desires. We do it for God as a duty because he has given us the grace to do it. And we cannot lay claim to having rendered any service that will bind God to show us any favor. Because the truth of the matter is that the reward that God gives us is a matter of what? Unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. It's out of his love and his mercy that he prospers our hands and rewards us not out of debt. God owes us nothing. I shared with you before, a last young man came to me and said, well, I want what God, I want what God owes me. I said, you don't want that. You, you don't want that at all. Don't say that because the only thing that God owes you and I is wrath and hell. That's what we deserve. But because of Jesus, because of grace and mercy, we don't receive that. Okay, he inflicted his own son with what we deserve. And so it's out of love and mercy that he prospers our hands. Okay, because remember, God owes us nothing. You remember the story of Joseph? I shared my reflections about a month ago about Joseph and all that God put him through and all the trouble and being thrown to a pit by his brothers and then sold into slavery to part of his house and all these things that happened to him. But one thing you notice is a common thread in Joseph's life that everywhere he was, no matter how bad it was, he served the Lord. And, and the pagans noticed that he was faithful and everything he did. But why? It's not that Joseph was any special thing to any degree. It's because the Bible says that God prospered his hands. God prospered his hands. And so we have to remember that even on our most faithful day, if you can remember your most faithful day in serving God, it is still imperfect in our sincerity. It is often lacking in our complete cheerfulness. It is usually imperfect in our faithfulness in serving him. But yet God rewards our efforts and he invites us to rejoice with him in the fruit of it. That's what the parable of the talents is partially about. Matthew 25 Right? You know, there's a master who goes on a long journey. He has three servants. And he gives them a endowment. Notice he's given of his property to them. He gives them an endowment. He gives to one five talents, to one two, and there's one he gave one. And not because he was being partial, but the Bible says he gave according to their ability. You know, he's not going to give them something that they can't handle. So he gave them one. But notice only two prospered in God. The one that had five got five more by diligence. And commitment to his master. The one who had two got two more by diligence for his master. And you notice what they reward was that the master came back. They had to give an accounting to him. And he rewarded him with two things. But I think the latter is what's most.
most important. One, the first thing one of them is that, that, that because they were faithful in what little, that much more responsibility will be given. Okay? Remember, when you're serving God, when you start producing fruit in God, guess what? More is coming. Who much is given, much is required. I didn't make these words up. They're in the Bible. When Jesus teaches about the parable, when he teaches about the, uh, the, uh, the vine and the branches, the role of the Father, we miss. He is pruning the tree. Why do you prune branches? So that that branch can produce what? More fruit, not less fruit. And so in the parable of the talents, he rejoiced with them. He says, because you have been faithful of a little, right? I will give you much. But he says these words in the end, which is our true boy. He says, enter into the joy of your master. Enter into the joy of your master. That even though we can't take credit at the end of the day for the good things that God has done, that he allows us to be there to rejoice with him in the work and, and, and enjoy those fruits. And so this is the point that Jesus is making with the disciples about their attitude. And I close with this. He is not discouraging them or telling them that their worst for God is worthless. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's also not saying that they are worthless. Because as we know, when we read the Bible, that as children of God, we are blessed and highly favored by God. That's not what God is saying. Okay? He is warning them against pride that leads to self-glorification. Because any good we produce in our labors for the kingdom is all due to God. And as his children, our aim is to do his will, but with gladness of heart. In the spirit of love and gratitude. We don't want to serve God like, remember the oldest boy we did, Luke 15, the oldest boy in the parable of prodigal son? I told you that could have been easily have been uh, titled uh, the prodigal of the two lost sons. Okay? But they had the oldest boy, they have the youngest one that gets all the press in the front. Right? He goes off and leaves his father and has all this prodigal living and he comes back. And he is, you know, he repents. He comes back to the father and they rejoice. But there's another lost son out there in that field. Right. And in his exchange with his father, it reveals what? That number one, he took no gratitude. He took no gratitude. He was not thankful in serving his father. But he saw his work for his father as a burdensome duty. And he saw it as doing his father a favor. We don't want to be like that. Or as they say and the, the kids say in the modern culture, don't be like that guy. OK, this is what Jesus is saying. So instead of thinking of that I have to serve God, remember it's a privilege to serve God, we get to. We get to serve God. And when we fully embrace the privilege, it is to suffer, to serve in his name. Only then will we serve more and more in a way that brings him glory. And we will rejoice in that glory. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have poured out heaven with abundance of your grace and your mercy, that you not only made us a people who are not your people, but you've made us a people sanctified and set apart for your glory, but that you've given us something to do that we may co-labor with you in your works, in your will. That we may participate in the kingdom that you've said that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Why? Because on your son, Jesus Christ, it is founded. And it will be kept by you. But that you use through us to participate in these things. And so help us, Heavenly Father, to remember who we serve Help us to clothe ourselves in humility, but at the same time, remember the great treasures that you've made that we are to you. And that you have given us work, that you have saved us because you love us. And that the things that you are sharing with us today about humility is because simply this, that you are trying to make us like you. That we will operate out of a spirit of meekness. That in the earth that we suffer with you, that we would be like the man of sorrows. That we would rejoice when you are glorified like your son. And that we will be willing to serve with the entirety of our life to the end until you retire us 
and bring us to yourself, to your reward, which is Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we just pray, Father, let that this word would stay with us today and that you keep us. We pray this prayer, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.